thanks so much everybody again for coming today. We're so excited um, to host this seminar. Uh, just to introduce myself to each of you, my name is Grant Wells. I'm Director of Innovation and Development for the Maternal and Child Health Research Institute. Um, today we're joined by Kevin Grimes, Co-Director of SPARC, uh, as many of you probably know. We have Don Bravo, who's a research scientist in uh, ENT, as well as Will, Will Goodyear in pediatric cardiology, and Paul Vogel, who's a postdoc in genetics. We're just so excited by each of these projects. They really complement the direction of what we're trying to accomplish with this partnership. Um, really a nice um, matrix of, of therapeutic opportunities. Um, that exist that are homegrown here at Stanford and um, so you know excited to introduce those to you today. Uh, next slide please. Just uh, a, a little bit of marketing before we dive a little bit deeper just so everybody has this on their calendars we um, annually put on a symposium every year which we really are excited about um, focused on uh, this year having Kelly Moe who's the Deputy Director of Reproductive Health Technologies at the Gates Foundation. And what a wonderful opportunity that we have um, for her to attend. Um, we've got some interesting sessions, as you see there. Um, it'll take place Thursday, October 28th. It'll be essentially all day. So please make mark your calendars. We also have a poster session where uh, you can uh, actively submit abstracts. You can go on our website and find that information um, now. Uh, and some housekeeping before we get started, um, just be advised, uh, we're gonna save the Q&A just based on the number of um, presentations we have to get through today to the end. Um, you can put that information in the chat and I'll screen that information as we go through. Um, if there are things that we can address um, during those times, we'll try and get to those just so we can maximize our time at the end. Um, but want to transition now, um, just to introduce Kevin Grimes. Uh, to each of you. Um, MCHRI and SPARC have had a long-standing, very successful partnership focused on translating unmet needs for maternal and child health. Um, want to kind of give the floor to Kevin now. He can tell you a little bit more about that and also um, introduce you to each one of these speakers here. So Kevin, take it away. Oh, sorry, on mute. Grant, thanks very much for the kind introduction. And let me see if I can pull up my slides. Um, are you guys able to see them? Yes. Fantastic. So first of all, I really want to thank MCHRI, their leadership and staff for the support of the Spark projects over the years. Um, from the beginning, Spark has had a particular focus on projects addressing maternal and child health needs, largely because we knew that the industry was ignoring those. Um, and several years into Spark, we were fortunate enough to be approached by MCHRI and uh, established a collaborative relationship, which has really been fantastic um, from a Spark perspective. Um, typically, what happens is MCHRI provides first year funding for a number of projects addressing maternal and child health needs, and SPARC provides the second year, and both groups provide input um, and advice regarding how best to advance the project so that we can move it forward, either to an industry partnership, if that's going to be required, or directly to patients. Um, so I am, the agenda for today, briefly, is I'll give you a quick introduction into SPARC and our MCHRI collaboration. Uh, then we will have the three projects present, and then the last 10 minutes we'll be saving for Q&A. Uh, for those of you not familiar with the program, SPARC is a partnership between the university and individuals from the local biotech ecosystem. And we have three primary missions, educate our faculty, fellows, and graduate students on how to advance a promising new discovery so that it becomes standard of care in patients. Uh, number two, um, to actually try and make that happen. We take in about a dozen or so projects per year. They'll typically stay in the program for two years and we try and help de-risk and move towards the clinic. And number three, we do try and improve the system as we can. Uh, for example, we're working with FDA to come up with new regulatory paradigms for preventive therapies. Uh, we've been applying AI tools and omics to try and 
um, figure out better ways to validate our targets before we put a lot of effort and expense into those. Um, and uh, we've been working on the financial engineering side as well. So how does Spark work? We bring together advisors from across the ecosystem, healthcare investors, serial entrepreneurs, folks who spent their entire careers in the deep disciplines related to drug discovery and, and uh, development. Uh, we meet on a weekly basis on, on campus when it's not during COVID on Zoom since COVID. Um, and we share ideas. There's no hierarchy. We don't try to achieve a consensus. We really try and provide information to the Stanford teams who are trying to develop the therapeutic and diagnostic projects. And we all learn from both our successes and our failures. Uh, so what do we teach? We try and encourage our teams to really think about what the end product should be at the very beginning. What are the essential characteristics? Um, we provide funding based on milestones, um, propose a budget to achieve particular milestones. And then when you accomplish them, we'll talk about the next milestones to fund. We try and introduce project management skills. We provide an education that's focusing on product development. Um, we facilitate mentorship by our advisors who are pretty knowledgeable industry veterans. And we'll also provide introductions um, to potential collaborators and to potential commercial partners when the time is right for a given project. Uh, we do teach some entrepreneurial scares, uh, skills as well. Our track record over time, we've been going now for about 15 years. And uh, latest tally is 56% of our graduates have been successful by our current metrics. 32% um, have gone out and formed startup companies. Another 12% have been licensed into existing biotech companies. Um, and about 12% we've brought into clinical trials directly. Typically, these are re repurposing drugs for new clinical indications or uh, bringing homegrown Stanford projects into the clinic, for example, cell therapies for which we have a GMP facility um, uh, to develop the therapeutics. Um, of those 44% of quote failed projects, a significant proportion of them are still ongoing um, and have not pulled a plug. Some have failed proof of concept, or in some cases, as happens in academia, um, people on the team have moved on before we've, we've reached critical milestones and we've had to let the project go. Um, over the history of Spark, we've now taken in 215 projects. Uh, 84 of those projects have focused on child and maternal health. So just about 40% of Spark projects address child and mater maternal health issues. Um, our child and maternal health specific outcomes pretty similar uh, to what we have seen um, with the program overall. Um, and you can see these numbers. In fact, I think we're slightly higher success rate with our MCHRI projects uh, than the overall Spark program, which is um, interesting because getting industry interested in uh, pediatric and maternal health projects is not always the easiest thing to do. Um, we are indication as not agnostic, and I'm throwing out just a few different indications that we've addressed over time. Uh, we have currently two therapeutics in for childhood cancer in clinical trial. One is a small molecule. The trial is being conducted by the Pediatric Brain Tumor Consortium. Uh, another is being conducted here. It's Michelle Mangi and Chris Mount's CAR-T program for diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma. Um, we have a therapeutic for perforated tympanic membranes. It's a biologic delivered topically by a squeeze into the ear. Um, and that has been licensed out to a startup company and partnered with a Japanese company called Astellas and is going into clinical trials shortly. Um, this will be really important, particularly in the developing world where surgery to repair a tympanic membrane is not an option. Um, and just one topical application seems to do the trick. Uh, we've developed, we're working with a, a team that's developed a platform to delivering nucleic acid therapies, um, can target them to the spleen, to the liver, uh, to the lung uh, and working on ways to make it more specific to other organs as well. A very promising platform. Um, we've repurposed a small molecule for eating disorders and published the results of the clinical trial for binge eating disorders and bulimia and uh, showed success. Um, so hopefully can change clinical practice. Um, we have a recent startup company that's developing a small molecule therapy for mitochondrial disorders to improve mitochondrial function as well as 
to improve mitochondrial biogenesis. Uh, we have a repurposed small molecule that is being developed for cystic fibrosis that's been uh, given to literally thousands of adult patients for another indication uh, and turns out is, is uh, likely to be highly effective um, for improving um, the bronchial epithelium and cystic fibrosis and probably epithelium elsewhere as well. Um, and we're working on a new therapy for type 1 diabetes, uh, hopefully would be disease modifying to prevent progression of the disease targeting a particular isoform of a protein involved in the immune response that we see in that disorder. Um, and lastly, just wanted to mention, we have um, student teams that are working, uh, graduate or actually took our drug discovery course this past winter and spring quarter. Uh, we have two SPARC student teams working on developing novel therapies for preeclampsia. One is a peptide, another is a biologic. Uh, we have another team working on delivering antidepressants um, for women who become depressed during pregnancy that will minimize systemic exposure and therefore exposure to the developing baby. Um, and we have another team developing a biologic that will be directly injected into the uterus for women who are having recurrent implantation failure. Um, and lastly, I wanted to say, please um, think about applying to Spark if you have projects that you think might be beneficial. We take in uh, both therapeutic and diagnostic projects. Um, and if you have something that you think could really help advance maternal and child health, we'd love to work with you and try and make that happen. Um, so with that, I am going to stop sharing and I'm going to invite Paul Vogel um, to go ahead and uh, begin his presentation on their uh, very novel approach for editing um, RNA uh, messenger RNA. Take it away, Paul. Yes, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Yes. All right, yeah, thank you very much, um, Kevin, for, for the introduction. Um, hi, everyone, and thank you very much for the opportunity to present our Spark project today. My name is Paul. I'm a postdoc in Jim Bidi Lee's lab in the genetics department. And in this project, I work um, together in a team with my PI, Billy, my colleague uh, Inga, who is also a postdoc at Betty's group, and then also Rohini, who have uh, recently joined the lab. So um, we are working on a new technology, uh, technology, a new transcriptome engineering technology using RNA editing for the specific and efficient change of genetic information, which overcomes um, challenges and limitation of other competing technologies. So like the gold standard of DNA editing, CRISPR-Cas, RNA editing has the power to rewrite genetic information, but lacks those unmet safety concerns that are associated with CRISPR, which are the permanent installation of potentially harmful off-target mutations in the genome and the immunogenicity caused by the bacteria Cas protein. In, con in contrast, all changes of genetic information that we make uh, made by RNA editing are reversible so that this strategy dramatically increases the safety profile of this kind of therapeutic intervention. On the other hand, RNA editing can take advantage of the tremendous progress made um, in classic RNA therapy using ASOS and siRNAs that have already been proven to be safe and effective in the clinic. These classical approaches, however, can only allow the suppression of protein production our technology brings RNA editing to a new level as it also allows the repair or fine tuning of proteins. The reaction we harness to change um, genetic information is the conversion of adenosine to inosine, known as IA to I editing. And since inosine is biochemically interpreted as guanosine by the cellular machinery, A to I editing formally introduces A to G point mutation. Um, that changes the genetic information in the, uh, encoded in the RNA and can uh, regulate uh, multiple biological processes. Naturally, the um, A to I RNA editing reaction is catalyzed by the human endogenous RNA editing enzyme called ADA, which binds to double-stranded RNA and edits millions of sites in the transcriptome of higher organisms. One major aspect is that ADA is abundantly present throughout the body. So it is perfectly suited um, to perform therapeutic um, RNA editing in a wide variety of uh, tissues. 
The challenge we faced two and a half years ago was how to direct the promiscuous enzyme to, um, to a chosen target site in the transcriptome to do a single A to I change. So in a team with um, Torsten Staffers from Tübingen University, we have developed a technology that is called Restore, which uses chemically modified antisense oligonucleotides termed ASOs um, that are um, that are designed to bind the target RNA and this duplex formed between the ASO and the target RNA is eventually recognized by the endogenous um, ADA enzyme that catalyzes A to I editing at the user-defined site uh, in the mRNA. And since this reaction of adenosine to guanosine, uh, uh, of inosine leads to the interpretation of guanosine at that site, our technology enables the programmable rewriting of genetic information by simply using oligonucleotides. And exactly this makes this method so attractive for therapeutic application as one does not need to deliver an extra enzyme like CRISPR-Cas, but only an ASO by using concepts that have been already developed for classic RNA therapy. In our proof of concept study, we transfected our ASOs into various cell types, isolated the RNA and analyzed the RNA editing yield by Sanger sequencing. And as an example here, we achieved efficient editing at the site in the GAPDH mRNA um, besides several other target sites. Additionally, we investigated the specificity of Restore by analyzing the global editing in cells, and we could show that we do not disturb the natural editing homeostasis as editing of natural substrates. All those black dots here remains the same between cells that contain the ASO and those without. Also, we showed that the ASO cause only uh, edit, uh, cause off-target editing only at four sites in the entire transcriptome here, these red dots, where you can imagine that theoretically editing of millions of off-target sites would be possible. And these sites uh, are mostly located in non-coding uh, region of, uh, of the mRNA and edited to low percentage. And one should note that these off-target sites um, disappears uh, also with our newest ASO versions highlighting the promising safety profile of this uh, technology. The therapeutic potential of RNA editing as indicated uh, results from its ability to change genetic information. More precisely, all three stop codons and 12 out of the 20 canonical amino acids can be recoded by A to I uh, editing. The most obvious application is, of course, the repair of G2A point mutation that mostly cause rare diseases. And this is what we are currently focusing on in this uh, Spark project. However, we also started to use our technology for an even more appealing possibility, which is to introduce so-called beneficial editing. This is a category that allows many highly effective, uh, attractive therapeutic application. For example, editing can be used to activate vial type proteins that support cancer immunotherapy or tissue regeneration. And as many disease indications like cancer or CNS disease uh, can be potentially treated, the concept of beneficial um, editing has high commercial potential. So in the Spark um, program, as I said, we focus uh, on diseases that are caused by uh, G2A point mutation. The first one is called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So in 98% of the cases, the disease is caused by this G2A point mutation here, which makes the protein into prone form to form toxic polymers in the liver. And besides um, the liver, the disease also affects the lungs. Since this polymerization prevents the protein to be released into the bloodstream for its transport into the lungs, red protects them uh, from proteolytic degradation. Therefore, people carrying this G2A point mutation have a high risk for the developing liver cirrhosis and lung affecting COPD. It's a very tricky disease since it's a kind of um, gain of function mutation and loss of function mutation at the same time. So therefore current treatment options are highly limited and can only, uh, and those that are currently developed can only um, often treat uh, one of the disease uh, phenotypes in contrast with our technology, one has the power to treat the whole spectrum of the disease. In our experiments, in our in vivo experiments, we use a mouse model that, that expresses the human AET uh, transcript with this G2A point mutation. We regularly uh, administer our ASO 
intravenously into the mice and quantify the editing of the target transcript in the liver. This is the place where AET is expressed. And we also quantify um, the plot release of repaired AET in the mouse by using an, an ELISA assay. So uh, and as seen in patient, this mouse model um, shows a reduction in AET blood levels, which results from this polymerization of the protein in the liver. And when this G2A point mutation is successfully edited, one should observe an increase in AET blood concentration as more protein can be re released after the repair. And exactly this happened after administering our AET specific ASO. So we detected an increase of AET blood concentration over a therapeutic threshold of five times more that would be already sufficient to completely eradicate the risk for developing the lung disease in human AET deficiency patients. Sinus sequencing of the target cDNA also confirmed that our chemically optimized uh, ASOs lead to highly specific editing of the target site without causing any off-target editing of neighboring adenosines. The second um, disease we address in SPARC um, is Hurler syndrome, which is mainly caused by a G2A point mutation introducing a premature translation stop of the ubiquitinously expressed EDUA enzyme, and the resulting loss of EDUA prevents the degradation of um, so-called clacoaminoglucanes, uh, 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 which accumulates in the cell and leading to the um, impairment of cell function. And patients with this devastating disease suffer from a wide variety of symptoms, and they typically die before reaching the age of, of uh, 10 years. Um, in our in vivo um, experiments, we use a mouse model that um, carries a nonsense mutation in the endogenous EDUA gene, which is analogous to the human premature stop codon. And also here we focus on the repair of the mutation in the liver. And besides the quantification of the RNA editing, we measure the activity of the EDUA protein by using a substrate once it gets really, uh, once it gets cleaves. Um, by the by EDUA, you can measure the fluores, uh, fluorescence of the cleave product. And the goal is here to see an increase of fluorescence, which would indicate a regaining of protein activity by successful re repair of the premature stop codon in the EDUA transcript. Here, it's a bit too early to show you the results, uh, but based on our preliminary results, um, ASO treated mice showed um, restored EDUA activity, resulting in a decrease uh, also of the toxic GAC uh, content in the liver compared to control mice. So besides the optimization of the ASO chemistry and delivery, we also aim to optimize the um, ASO sequence. Currently designed ASOs are more or less fully complementary to the target sequence, which gives editing yields up to 80% for some target sites, but for the majority of cases, it is less than 80%. And our lab have studied the ADA RNA editing biology already for several years. And we know that um, natural editing substrates of ADA have several structural features like mismatches, uh, loops, uh, or wobble-based pairs that enable ADA to edit highly specifically single sites uh, um, uh, sites in these traps with efficiency reaching up to 100%. So coming back to our approach, we therefore think that site-directed RNA editing with ADA recruiting ASO um, will also benefit when those structural features are present in the duplex between ASO and um, the target RNA. Currently, it is impossible to predict which structural features can help to increase editing at the chosen target site. And it's very likely that this differ from target site to target site, as it also op uh, is observed for natural ADA substrates. And to identify the uh, structural features, we have developed a method that allows the simultaneous streaming of tens of thousands of ASO sequences um, that form different secondary structures with the target. And indeed, we already had success using this method and have identified ASO sequences that gives three times better editing at a chosen target site that currently designed sequence. And now we have started to extend our um, screen for 20 plus tar uh, disease targets in order to find highly efficient ASO sequences for this uh, indications. So to, to sum up, 
I hope I could convince you that endogenous ADA can be used to change genetic information in a highly programmable manner. We can design ADA recruiting ACEs that gives efficient editing with high specificity, even uh, with multiple neighboring adenosines in the target sequence. We were successful uh, in translating the technology in the mouse model of um, AT deficiency and Hurler syndrome, which shows us that we are on the right path towards the therapeutic use of RNA editing for this diseases in human patients. And with this slide, I want to acknowledge uh, our collaborators, especially Daria, Kevin, Rico from, from Spark, the Staffos group with which we still closely work together, Feiji um, from, from Marquez lab, who did the uh, mouse injection and also Jeff Techman for providing the AT mouse model. And also special thanks um, to the MCHRI that significantly financed this project. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to take any question in the uh, Q&A session. Paul, oh, thanks very much. That's beautiful science that uh, you and Inga and Jim Billy uh, have, have accomplished. So I'm very excited to see this move into patients. So next, we're going to move on to Will Goodyear, who's an instructor in pediatrics and is going to talk to us about his project to help delineate the cardiac conduction pathways to avoid damage during heart surgery. Thanks very much, Kevin. Um, so I just want to first off, thanks. Uh, thank uh, Stanford MCHRI and Spark for allowing us to speak about our Spark project today. So thanks very much. Our project team consists of myself. Uh, I'm an instructor in pediatric cardiology and electrophysiology here in the Department of Pediatrics at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. Um, I specialize in molecular and developmental biology uh, with a particular focus in the cardiac conduction system, uh, which we'll be speaking about today. Uh, Sean Wu, who's an associate professor in the Department of Medicine um, and by courtesy of pediatrics, uh, who has an expertise in the molecular mechanisms underlying congenital heart development and disease. Evan Rosenthal uh, is a professor in otolaryngology and radiology, um, and has really been a pioneer in the field of translational optical imaging tools for uh, tumor imaging and resection, and currently serves as the lead PI in several early phase uh, clinical trials uh, here in molecular oncology. Dr. Chayton Kosla is a professor of engineering um, with expertise in antibody conjugation and structure-based uh, structure antibody optimization. And finally, in the consultant roles, we have uh, both Dr. Frank Hanley and Dr. Joseph Wu, uh, the chairs of both pediatric and adult cardiothoracic surgery at LPCH and Stanford, respectively. Now, coordinated beating of the heart uh, requires a specialized subset of heart cells known as the cardiac conduction system, which is essentially the electrical wiring of the heart seen here on purple on the right. The conduction system is made up of multiple distinct components including the SA node or pacemaker of the heart, the AV node, his bundle, bundle branches, and Perkin G fiber network. Damage to any one of these components can lead to a host of life-threatening arrhythmias, including pacemaker dysfunction, heart block, and even ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation. The unmet medical need that we're trying to address here um, is the accidental damage to the conduction system that occurs during cardiac surgeries. Congenital heart disease um, represents the most common birth defect um, and afflicts roughly one in about 100 live births. And what you're looking at here in the center um, is the inside of a heart from the perspective of a cardiac surgeon. Now this heart has a uh, ventricular septal defect or more simply a hole between the bottom two chambers of the heart for which a patch will need to be sutured into place. What you don't see, however, is the conduction system coursing around this defect and other pivotal structures of the heart, uh, primarily the heart valves. So importantly, the conduction system is invisible to the naked eye. Current standard of care uh, entails the use of anatomical landmarks to estimate the location of the conduction system. And as a result, Nearly one to 3% of all congenital heart disease surgeries results in conduction system damage through inadvertent incision or suture placement. Further, 
when actually looking at some of the most common congenital heart disease repairs in this region, such as ventricular septal defects, tetralogy of flow repairs, this number goes way up. Similarly, in the adult world, um, eight to 25% of all adult heart valve surgeries, for which there are about 100,000 uh, in the US annually alone, also result in conduction system damage. Together, these uh, result in increased costs and longer hospital stay and represent a significant source of morbidity and mortality. And unfortunately for most, a lifelong uh, pacemaker dependency. So to address this unmet medical need, we've created Illuminode. So this is an optical imaging agent um, that allows for the real-time visualization of the conduction system in the operating suite. Illuminode uh, consists of a antibody that's been directed against uh, the cardiac conduction system um, and that has been co uh, covalently conjugated to this near infrared dye. So we envision Illuminode being used as a systemic agent uh, provided to patients as a single intravenous injection prior to the surgery, thereby allowing the surgeons to visualize the cardiac conduction system in real time with the help of a camera and thereby helping to minimize iatrogenic damage. In proof of uh, principle experiments, we've been able to show that single injections of aluminode into mice results in complete labeling of the cardiac conduction system in vivo. So here for this experiment, uh, we took wild type mice and injected them with aluminode. And after 24 hours, their hearts were harvested and imaged in this closed field and near infrared signal detection system. In control hearts uh, that were harvested from mice injected with random IgG antibody that's conjugated to this same near infrared dye, we see no specific signal within the heart. In contrast, in mice that were injected with aluminode, we see complete labeling of the conduction system with high signal to noise background, or uh, ratios rather. Um, and as, as this um, near infrared uh, signal detection system isn't, uh, wasn't made for, these, uh, for imaging these small hearts, which are kind of a, approximately on the size of a dime, we next turn to light imaging uh, or uh, light sheet microscopy, microscopy uh, to really get a sense of the, the true resolution of aluminode. So what you're looking at, looking at here um, is an intact heart that was derived from a mouse injected 24 hours prior uh, with aluminode. So everything you see in gold is the aluminode signal uh, that is staining the entirety of the cardiac conduction system. And again, just for frame of reference, each, this, each one of these hearts are about the size of a dime and yet the resolution of aluminode is, um, is um, adequate enough for to be able to visualize all the detailed structure um, that is the cardiac conduction system. Next, to confirm the specificity of aluminode, we turn to uh, basic immunofluorescence, essentially. So what we did was we took these hearts, we fixed them, sectioned them, and stained them against markers um, known uh, to, to mark the cardiac conduction system. So in this bottom panel, uh, we have the SA node or the pacemaker of the heart stained in red using an antibody directed against HCN4, a known marker of the SA node. In purple below, we have the signal from aluminode, which um, co-labels the SA node with 100% specificity. This is not only true of the SA node, but all other components of the conduction system, including the AV node, Hiss, bonal branches, and Purkin G fibers. Next, uh, we perform dosage analyses. Uh, here we took, again, wild type mice and injected them with a range of aluminode doses. On day three, we harvested their hearts and imaged them using these, uh, this uh, closed field imaging, uh, near infrared imaging system. At all doses uh, tested, we found a good signal to background ratios um, uh, above the control IgG 800 injections and found an optimal dosing at 75 mics or roughly two mg per kilo. Next, using this optimal uh, dosing, we then performed a time course analyses where we injected the mice with the two mg per kilo 
and found excellent signal to background ratios, even out to four days fo um, following the initial uh, injection. With respect to buyer distribution, outside of the heart, we found signal, near infrared signal, also within uh, the liver and kidney, consistent with its uh, metabolism and excretion from the body. Importantly, from a, a surgical perspective, we found that the tissue uh, directly sur uh, surrounding the surgical field, namely the lung tissue, uh, we found no background uh, near infrared signal whatsoever. And finally, we've been able to show uh, that Illuminote is safe. So even at high dosing, so two times the normal range of, or effective range of luminote dosing, we found that it does not impair CCS function as measured by surface electrocardiogram. So in summary, we've been able to uh, create um, this uh, uh, underlying technology, Illuminode, which is a targeted optical imaging tool consisting of an antibody directed against the cardiac conduction system, co covalently conjugated to near infrared dye. Following single tail vein injection in mice, we've been able to show that it um, provides highly sensitive, specific, and safe labeling of the entire murine cardiac conduction system. Um, so we've, uh, we're just wrapping up our first two years on this project, um, entailing uh, both lead generation as well as uh, some of the proof of concept experiments that I've described here today. We've also been able to secure intellectual property through Stanford OTL, and we've been able to do all of this um, through the generous um, um, funding and uh, mentorship provided by the Stanford uh, MCHRI and Spark. So we're currently entering into years three and four, uh, where we are planning to scale up to large animal studies. Um, specifically, we're looking to do this in vivo uh, with a pig model, as well as ex vivo using human uh, donor human hearts uh, with a Langendorf perfusion setup. So we've acquired all of the regulatory uh, approvals to be able to move on with these experiments um, and establish contacts with local donor networks to be able to acquire the human hearts. Um, in parallel, we are also looking to scale up the production of our lead compound uh, with GMP uh, before ultimately applying uh, for IND application with the FDA. And uh, the main goal is ultimately to enter into clinical trials in the years to come. Uh, so with that, we have a lot of people to thank, obviously, everybody uh, in the Illumino project, um, our funding sources, in particular, the Stanford Spark Translational Grant and the MCHRI Pilot Grant, both of which have been really uh, uh, transformational for us. Um, and then a special shout outs to Dr. Mario, uh, Daria Mowgli rosen Dr. Kevin Grimes, um, our um, uh, project manager at Spark, Dr. Peter Santa Maria, and then uh, through MCHRI Grant Wells, and then uh, Dr. Kasha Hanek uh, and all other Spark advisors that have been really, again, um, incredibly helpful in moving this project along. So thanks very much. Well, thanks very much. That's really, really exciting. I look forward to uh, the day when we can start using it in the operating room. Um, our next presenter is Don Bravo, who is uh, from the Department of Otolaryngology, and she's been working with uh, Professor Jayakar Nayak uh, to um, reduce gene therapy to practice in cystic fibrosis. So Don, take it away. Thank you. Can you see my screen okay? Yes. Okay, thank you, Kevin. And thank you very much to the MCHRI for giving us the opportunity to present our work on an autonomous gene corrected stem cell therapy to treat cystic fibrosis. Uh, we have a team of experts in CRISPR gene editing, cystic fibrosis and pulmonology, cell transplantation, stem cell and organoid expansion, bioengineering and biomaterials, and upper airway stem cell biology and physiology. So cystic fibrosis is a life-threatening inherited genetic disease that affects 30,000 patients in the United States and over 100,000 worldwide. It's caused by mutations to the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator or CFTR gene that I'll refer to now. The CFTR protein transports chloride and bicarbonate ions out of the cell and uh, uh, mutations to the CFTR reduces ion transport or hinders it, causing severe detriment to exocrine function. And especially in the airways, the thick mucus accumulates leading to infections, inflammation and airway obstruction. 
So the median survival age for cystic fibrosis patients has been increasing, thankfully, uh, due to medical advances and inhaled um, uh, treatments uh, and current methods are focusing on CFTR protein and CFTR gene targeting. So while there's no cure for cystic fibrosis, life expectancy is steadily improving with a median survival age at about 37 years of age. So there's six classes of mutations, class one uh, being the most, uh, causing the most morbidity uh, due to the fact no protein is made. Class two represents the most common mutation, the Delta F508 mutation affecting greater than 70 patients. And class three and class four uh, have different uh, forms of the protein, uh, but all malfunctioning in ion transport. Class five and six have just a fewer protein that, that makes it to the plasma membrane. But uh, the spectrum of mutations, over 2,000 have been uh, discovered alone. But the major morbidity is due to respiratory failure, uh, severe and recurrent sinus and lung infections, and obstructive mucus and inflammation in the airways occur. The patients constantly have to treat their airways through their life, uh, ultimately, uh, though, uh, leading to lung failure and early death in these patients. So current medications like the trichaptic medications have been helpful in the treatment of cystic fibrosis because they increase CFTR density and function at the cell surface. But um, patients with class one mutations are not candidates for these drugs. So these medications are very expensive, costing upwards of 300,000 per year, require, require daily administration and can have severe side effects. So a personalized durable uh, stem cell therapy rooted in CFTR gene correction is desired to restore CFTR function and airway cell and epithelial integrity. So uh, our collaborative team is focusing on ex vivo stem cell therapy. Um, in vivo cell therapies have been tried, but without much success. So our goal is to isolate a patient's upper airway stem cells, uh, expand them, also called uh, UABCs, and perform CRISPR gene editing to correct the CFTR mutation and transplant them back into the patient. Uh, the transplantation of autologous airway stem cells from cystic fibrosis patients once corrected corrected ex vivo will bypass the barriers to in vivo gene correction uh, therapies that have been performed. So the goal is to develop a durable stem cell therapy by surgical replacement of gene corrected upper airway basal stem cells. So the goal then is to isolate the patient's upper airway stem cells, correct the CFTR mutation, and then transplant them back into the patient. And the proof of concept would be to perform this in immune compromised rodent models first. So we isolate a patient's uh, uh, upper airway tissue by endoscopic procedures or in the office visit by nasal brush pr procedures. We then expand these cells by uh, uh, with the help of Calvin Quo's group. We then perform CRISPR gene editing performed in Matt Porteous's group. We then check for the functional restoration of the CFTR transporter. This is performed by Zach Sellers, Jeffrey Wine, uh, Carlos Mila, and Tushar Desai. And now we're ready to uh, investigate means of transplantation and engraftment, starting with finding the optimal FDA-approved matrices uh, in which to implant these or transplant these cells into rodent immune-compromised model systems. So we first uh, extract the tissue, uh, um, expand the, the basal stem cells. This is done in by five to uh, tenfold in about five days uh, by a media developed by Amin Childehin in Calvin Quo's group. We can expand by either nasosphere organoid formation or monolayers. And then we're ready to perform CRISPR gene editing. Uh, Sri Ram Vedanathan from Matt uh, Portis's group first targeted the Delta F508 mutation, the most common mutation. Uh, he was able to get up to a 60% correction efficiency with this method. He also then wanted to try to correct the entire gene to account for all those mutations I mentioned. And Matt Cordius's group has been able to, using two adeno-associated donor vectors with two halves of the entire gene uh, by homologous recombination, correct the entire gene, which is what Trirom was able to do, uh, and also including a truncated CD19 tag to enrich for these corrected cells, uh, giving us a 60 to 80% uh, correction 
uh, efficiency of these cells upon enrichment. And this work was recently published in Cell Stem Cell and Molecular Therapy. We're now ready then to uh, investigate the proper functioning of the CFTR ion transport system. We do this by growing the uh, CFTR added stem cells on air liquid interface uh, cultures. And Matt Zell, uh, Zach Sellers in our group is able to, by using oocine chamber assays, study the ion transport of these uh, um, CFTR corrected uh, stem cells. Um, and so what we show is that uh, wild type non-CF samples, uh, we uh, can activate the uh, CFTR channel with forskolin, and then we can measure the inhibition of the transport ion um, uh, uh, transporter using a CFTR172 inhibitor. And we see that with uh, cystic fibrosis uh, uncorrected uh, stem cells patients, we see uh, very little activation with forskolin, therefore very little inhibition with the CFTR172 inhibitor. However, when we look at the corrected cystic fibrosis patient, uh, we see a strong activation uh, with forskolin of the ion channels and uh, thus inhibition of these ion channels representing greater than 70% of CFTR restoration with the full length corrected CFTR gene. So the ion transport mimics wild type control levels. This is very reproducible. And uh, so patients that have a 15% functional CFTR uh, protein lead normal lives. So uh, a functional restoration at this level has a uh, a um, curative potential. So now we're ready to investigate the new steps of trying to transport this into uh, immune compromised rodent models. So we first uh, started with a porous sign submucosal intestinal membrane that Jaker Nayak has repeatedly uh, implanted into patients, which we have shown promotes the growth of the basal stem cells and also differentiation as shown here with human CFTR corrected stem cells giving rise to ciliated cells shown in red and tight junction formation with E. cadherin. So now uh, we want to try to uh, implant these uh, membranes. Here is what um, Jay Karnayek has done to patients. Uh, this is what our stem cell therapy would look like should we advance uh, this far. So the SIS membrane has been inserted over for exposed bone following uh, the removal of infected tissue. The uh, SAS membrane promotes stem cell growth and remucalization, and the membrane is held in place by addition of a surgical glue. So um, I performed this in, um, in uh, um, immune compromised uh, rats initially, uh, located the uh, maxillary sinus, uh, made an incision near that area, cleared out the tissue, and then placed the SAS membrane containing the corrected human CFTR uh, stem cells, and then sutured up the animal. And also, I was able to perform this in mice as well. We also wanted to investigate other means of, of um, uh, debridement uh, by uh, medical chemical methods, for example, in which we want to remove the top layer of the epithelium, the um, differentiated cells, ciliated and goblet cells, down to the basal stem cell layer. And this is shown here with uh, ciliated cells shown in yellow, uh, mucus secreting cells shown in green, and we can denude down to the uh, basal stem cell layer with the hopes of uh, making our transplanted cells able to uh, engraft into the stem cell layer. So in order to visualize this, our first proof of concept then was to see if we could do this in using GFP luciferase cells, uh, stem cells isolated from mice um, and place them into immune compromised mice. So in vivo bioluminescence imaging after injection with luciferin is used to trace spatiotemporal engraftment of these cells. So I demonstrate here um, 
uh, stable engraftment using chemical debridement methods. I uh, hear we, after 40 days, we have a very stable engraftment, um, 60 days, 80 days, four months, six months, and even we're up to eight months. So a very stable, very consistent engraftment. And we've repeated this several times now. Uh, and visually, we can see this uh, very stable, permanent engraftment compared to control mice. And uh, histologically, we can see then that these GFP luciferase cells have in fact uh, engrafted into to the stem cell layer here that shows uh, in keratin five uh, staining in white. It, the cells do not engraft to all areas of the upper airways, but in certain locations and seem to be stably engrafted. Uh, st similarly, we looked at other um, uh, methods of debridement um, and we see similar um, engraftment um, uh, um, success. So uh, again, we see this is the stem cell layer and we see areas where these cells have engrafted. These are nascent basal stem cells uh, expressing GFP and their progeny will express GFP giving rise to the differentiated cells that are shown here, such as alpha tubulin staining for ciliated cells. So to our knowledge, this is this is the first example of transplantation of permanent um, cells into the airways. So why treat the upper airways first? Well, it's a great model system. We can monitor growth in an office visit. Uh, and oftentimes treating the upper airways has a beneficial effect on the lower airways. And in these patients who have constant infection, inflammation in their airways, this might really help them. And uh, if, the, if this method is successful, we will naturally target the lower airways. And based on this work, we've uh, been awarded a, a patent as well as a, um, and a R01 award from the NHLBI. And also we're very hopeful for our next step award, the Serum uh, Early Translational Award. Um, and so our next steps then would be to uh, go forward towards preclinical pre-IND, towards a phase one, phase two clinical trials. We've successfully developed uh, a method to correct the entire CFTR gene, therefore accomplishing uh, the entire entire mutation spectrum seen in these patients. We've now demonstrated that we're able to achieve a permanent transplantation of these cells. Our next goal then is to show this in human with human cystic fibrosis transplanted cells, uh, scale up for GMP grade, and then uh, have a pre-IND meeting with the uh, FDA. So this therapy, um, uh, should be, if successful in the upper airways, there are a number of diseases we can target in both children and in adults. Similarly, if this is um, successful, we can target the vast uh, uh, many diseases in the lower airways uh, that have such a, a burden on the healthcare system. And with that I'd love to thank our SPARC, incredible SPARC uh, program and funding and the Maternal and Child Health Research Institute and SURAM, our incredible SPARC program advisors and mentors, Peter Santa Maria, Jiwon Kim, Daria, Mochi Rosen and Kevin Grimes and many others and our incredible team and my mentor, Jay Karnayek. So thank you so much and happy to take questions in the end. John, that's an incredible accomplishment that you did. I think just keeping those seven collaborative teams together, which is, is uh, something that might be hard to do outside of Stanford, uh, is, is remarkable. But really troubleshooting and, and finding a way to make these, these cells and graft is, is really a tremendous accomplishment. So I think with that, we can open things up. Uh, Grant, if you want to take over and, and uh, handle the Q&A, that would be fantastic. I can. Please feel free to put questions in the chat um, if there's any reactions based on what you've seen today, um, and I'll try and uh, address some of those that have come up. Um, there were some questions that were addressed and answered. I think they're um, impactful just from an audience perspective, just so everybody can understand. Um, yes, the recording will be available. Um, I would encourage anybody that's interested in um, participating in Spark to go online and join. Um, it's really a, a great um, seminar that they host weekly as well as hopefully when we can be back in person, it's a lot of fun. Um, so 
The link is in the, the chat at the moment. And then for those that are interested in applying, um, if they've got some interesting projects, the, the funding rate is there, which is um, wonderful as well. Um, but uh, Sean just put a great question in. And um, so, uh, Paul, uh, if you're available on your, on your wonderful uh, project, um, can you just elaborate more on the delivery system for the ASO and what other cells will receive the ASO? besides the hepatocytes? Yeah, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, for our, so our ASOs, we typically deliver um, with LNPs. So LNPs are well known to, to target the liver. And, um, and especially, I mean, for, 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 the, for, for the cell types in the liver, it's not really, uh, only uh, limited to to hepatocytes, it will be also other cell types than than the than, than hepatocytes in the liver. But in principle, um, with LMP delivery, you have a really good um, liver targeting, and this is what we are doing now. Thanks so much, Paul. Uh, Sushma had a great question. Um, well, I think this is for you. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong. Can your tools and therapy be used to correct acquired alpha uh, 1AT deficiency, such as in PLE and Fontan patients? This will be for Paul as well. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Go ahead, Paul. I needed to, to read the question again. Can you tell me? I mean, yeah, so what we, I mean, for, for, the, for the first questions, I mean, I'm not sure what means acquired alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, though. What I can tell you is what, what I showed in my presentation was that we um, can repair this, 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 this set mutation. So this is this, this typical mutation. In 98% of the cases, people have that. And as I showed you, we, we can uh, repair this um, mutation on the RNA level. And we also see a, a phenotype change in, in the mouse, which is then um, the elevated AET blood levels <coughs> in, in, in the blood uh, of the mice. Because um, when you can correct this mutation, um, this protein does not form polymers anymore and can be then released into the bloodstream. I hope that answers somehow the question. Thanks, Paul. Um, if there are any other questions, we're almost at time. Um, but just want to give one last chance for anybody that has any uh, anything burning. This is Kevin. Okay. I have a quick question for Will, and that that is. Um, you know, the current operating room systems for near IR visualization, are, are they where you want them to be um, for introducing your, your uh, injectable diagnostic into the clinic? Yeah, so I think there is a great question, Kevin. I think that there are a couple elements to that. I think, um, so there are really two components. The, I mean, the injectable is the injectable. And so I, I think that that's the one thing that we can ideally, you know, eliminate as a problem. Um, and the imaging aspect of it, what is currently available um, and used in cl clinical trials right now to visualize tumor burden um, is a camera from Stryker uh, that essentially um, both emits and receives the near infrared signal and then projects that onto a, um, a high res screen. So absolutely functional. The only really negative um, is that it has to be about 20 centimeters away from your field of view. And so if it's a really tiny uh, infant, uh, that potentially could ca cause problems. Um, it really is gonna be kind of a trial and error for the really small, small patients. Um, having said that, I know that there are groups, for instance, in WashU that for about a decade have been working on specifically this concept. They've really kind of sawed down uh, their prescient and saw the, the value of near infrared in the surgical fields. Um, and so they've been working on, on goggles uh, for the surgeons just to wear and so that there wouldn't be any issue with proximity or anything like that or screen for that matter. That's great. Thank you.
thanks everybody. I didn't see anything new come in while that question was being answered, but just want to thank everyone um, for coming today and thank our panelists for uh, everything that they have presented and preparing the presentations. Um, and just thank Kevin on behalf of the MCHRI team uh, for our wonderful partnership. We're very excited about where this is going to go um, and how we're going to benefit pediatric and maternal uh, health going forward. Um, so everybody, you'll, you'll get a survey link at the end, um, but just thanks again for, um, for being there and um, hope everybody has a great rest of their week. Thank you, Grant, and thanks to MCHRI from Spark, and thank you to our speakers as well for all of your brilliant work. Uh, and thanks to the audience for, for dialing in. <laughs>